Scripture will come from 2 Timothy, the, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, starting in verse 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead and is appearing at his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out, out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of, the, of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. I was thinking about what a beautiful day it was, and I don't have anything to do, and you obviously don't have anything to do, so I thought I'd have an extra long sermon tonight. <laughs> now, I know you all want to get out here to watch the game. That's why I am going to preach a little longer tonight. <laughs> just, just kidding. It'll be normal. It'll be normal. But we're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, we're especially grateful for your presence. We hope you'll come back and be with us anytime you have opportunity. This Wednesday, we'll be meeting at 7 o'clock. We will be having a singing because it's the first Wednesday night of the month, but normally at that time, we have Bible studies, and normally at this time and starting next Sunday for the next month, we'll have uh, uh, Bible studies here in this room as well, uh, but we'd love to have you come and be with us at any or all of those services. Have you ever wondered, you know, you stop and think about uh, someone who preaches every single week, week after week after week after week, and especially if you stay someplace very long like I have. I've been here almost 14 years, be 14 years in, in uh, August, and people wonder, they'll say, well, how do you decide what to preach week after week? And that's kind of a challenge if you stop and think about it, especially if you stay someplace very long. And I've, been, I've had people ask me that. How do, you, how do you do that? So I thought we'd talk about that tonight. The passage that was read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, uh, is Paul's charge to Timothy. And in these verses, you kind of have a summation of the work of an evangelist. Uh, the whole letter, really, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus deals with this, but this right here is kind of a nice summary of the work of an evangelist. And in verse 1, he says, I charge you. Now, a charge, this is a very serious obligation. And I take, and I think most preachers that I know, take the obligation of preaching very seriously, and you should, because it's a charge, a solemn uh, obligation given by God. He says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and, and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. So I'm going to be judged for the things that I teach. And so I strive very hard to make sure that what I'm saying is correct uh, and true to the book. And then he says in verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Preach the word, nice summary, but then he says you need to be ready. And, and the phrase in season and out of season in plain English means when they like it and when they don't. When it's popular and when it's not. You have to just you have to say what needs to be said and when it needs to be said. Your preaching is going to be positive and negative. It's going to be convincing, it's going to be rebuking and exhorting. And then he says, with all long-suffering and teaching. Many years ago, a friend of mine, uh, you've heard me mention many times, Randall McPherson, he said, if you can stay 10 years at some place and you see this much change, you've done something. And preachers need to learn that. You can't change something overnight. You can't preach a sermon and then all, everything, you know, everything comes up roses. It doesn't work that way. And sometimes things have to be preached over and over and over again before they settle in. But as we think about that charge and the obligation to preach from week to week, how would a preacher go about choosing his topics each time he gets in the pulpit? What does he do? What are some things that he might look at? And that's kind of what the lesson is about tonight. The first thing that pops into my mind, and I think is very important, and that is just dealing with basic themes of the gospel. You know, these topics, these basic things are always in order. And every once in a while you even hear me say, today we go back to the basics. Today we're going to talk about the death of Jesus, or today we're going to talk about baptism, or today we're going to talk about the plan of salvation. It's always appropriate to go back to basics every once in a while. Now, you can't stay there. There are some people who think you can just stay there, and some think you should just stay there and never move on, but you can't do that. You've got to move on to other things. But basics are always appropriate because you never know who's in the audience. From week to week, and especially here, we have new visitors, 
people who may not be Christians, and they need to hear these basic things. Uh, your children, as they grow, when they're very young, they may not be paying a whole lot of attention to the preacher, uh, but at some point in their life, as they get a little older, they're going to start listening, and we never know when that point's going to be. And so returning to the basics, at some point, that might pique your child's interest, or it might pique a visitor's interest. And some examples of this uh, would be the plan of salvation. Turn your Bibles to Jude. In verse 3, and we're familiar with the verse, and Jude actually is indicating here, and we'll use the verse in both ways this evening, but Jude indicates that he was originally going to talk about one thing and changed his topic to something else. Jude verse 3, he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I'll just stop right there. He said, that's what I was going to talk to you about. That's a basic theme. Our common salvation is a basic theme. How that we're saved in Christ and we're all saved in Christ the same way and there isn't one plan for you and another plan for me. We all yield to the same plan. That's a basic theme and it needs to be addressed every now and then. Another basic theme would be the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I like to preach on that a lot because I think that's the heart of the gospel. Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, he said, I delivered to you that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he even indicates in that verse that that is of primary importance. I delivered it to you first of all, he says. That's the heart of the gospel. That's a basic theme of the gospel. And then if you'll turn with me uh, over to Hebrews chapter 6. Here are some other basic themes. The Hebrew writer, and this is an interesting passage if you study it in its context, he wanted to talk to them about Melchizedek. And even today we have brethren who wonder about Mr. Melchizedek in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews. What is that all about? Uh, and, and they ask questions and sometimes people have some really off the wall ideals about Melchizedek. But Paul really wanted to talk about Melchizedek, but at the end of chapter 5 he says you're not ready for it. You should be ready for it. By this time you ought to be teachers, chapter 5 and verse 12, but somebody needs to take you back to kindergarten and teach you the first principles. And then in chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Now, I had said earlier, you can't stay on the elementary stuff. You can't stay on the basic stuff. You've got to leave it. You've got to move on. Leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And that word perfection means maturity. We've got to grow up in the faith. We've got to learn. And he says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms. And notice the plural there. And the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Those are basic themes. All of those are basic themes. Uh, that you need to return to time and time again. Repentance and faith and baptism. And if you study the word baptism in Scripture, there are like seven or eight different baptisms in the Bible. And that's why he uses the plural here, the doctrine of baptisms. And the laying on of hands, that was something that was done often in the first century to pass on miraculous gifts. But it was usually done immediately after a baptism. It would be a basic theme to those brethren. The resurrection. And the judgment, you see. All of these are basic things, and they're always good to talk about. And so one of the things I always try to do every month or so, or maybe every two months, but ever so often I'll return back to something basic like that. And I think that's where a lot of preachers get their ideas, uh, and it's not a bad thing to do. When I first started preaching, I used to think, nobody wants to hear about baptism. All these people have already been baptized, and they don't want to hear a sermon on baptism. And I learned that that's, that doesn't matter. We need to be reminded, and as I said earlier, you never know who's sitting in the audience. Your children are growing up, and they might be getting to the point now where they're listening about to this kind of stuff, and they might be interested in being baptized, or there might be a visitor. So regardless of the subject, regardless of how basic, it's always good to talk about it. Another thing that we might talk about are pressing issues. Sometimes pressing issues take precedence in our preaching because of uh, the, the times in which we live. And let's go back to Jude. We were talking about Jude earlier. Jude verse 3. I want to finish the verse and go on into verse 4. And this is an example. Jude had said, I want to talk to you about something very basic in Jude verse 3. I want to talk to you about our common salvation. You see that in the beginning of the verse. Beloved, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I was going to do that. But I found it necessary to write to you and exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The, the phrase contend earnestly suggests the idea of a struggle or a battle. 
there is a battle going on and a battle that must be waged. And he says, I wanted to write about a basic theme, but something pressing came up and I had to change. I had to change my topic, you see. And so he had to change and talk about contending for the faith. And why does he have to do that? Verse 4 tells us why. For certain men have crept in. Something's come up here. An issue, a circumstance. Certain men have crept in, unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. God knew they would come. And, 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 but he says they've come, you know. And he says, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. In other words, they turn grace into an excuse to keep on sinning. That's the very thing Paul said we shouldn't do in Romans 6. Remember, he said, should we keep on sinning, that grace might abound. He said, certainly not, or God forbid. But there are people who try to turn grace into an excuse or a license to sin. And so they've turned the grace of God into licentiousness. And that's a pressing issue. It's, it's on the front burner right now. And so it gets moved from the back burner to the front burner, and we need to deal with this. And you may not even be aware of some things. Most preachers and most elders try and stay on top of things. And they try and know what's going on in the brotherhood. And they try to know what's going on close by. And know what's being taught here and what's being taught there. And who's saying this and who's saying that. Because when these issues come up, then they can address it, you see. And, and that's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. But a lot of brethren sometimes are not aware of those things. They don't know that that's going on. Sometimes there's issues about worship. There are... Uh, in fact, I think, it might not so much around here, but there are places where some people are trying to resurge and bring back the instrument of music in worship. And if that were to ever come up, it would certainly be a time to preach about that, for sure, because that would be a violation of the faith, of the gospel, you see. And so we would have to put that on the front burner and talk about that. Sometimes people want to change the conditions of salvation. And they say, you don't have to be baptized, or you don't have to confess your sins as an erring Christian. And so that would be a pressing issue. If that came up, that would have to get moved to the front burner. A few years back, and you've heard me talk about this before, sometimes, brethren, we're, we're all disturbed about the deity of Christ and what that means and the humanity of Christ and what that means. That becomes a front burner issue then, and it has to be moved to the top of the heap. Sometimes there are disagreements about the church, all different aspects, the organization of the church or the work of the church. Or, or, or the worship of the church. And all these things, they come up from time to time and they need to be addressed. And so those are pressing issues that have to be covered from time to time. One of the places where I really like to get a lot of my sermons are questions that people ask. And a lot of you will do that. And I appreciate that, by the way. You'll come out and you'll ask, well, what about this? Or what, about, or what do you think about this? Or would you do a sermon on this? Or I've always wondered about that. And I'm always looking for that because it gives me a direction and it's something I know you're interested in, you see. And so those are, that's one of my favorite places to get uh, sermon ideas. You know, Jesus and Paul were often asked questions about their teaching. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 13. This is just one example. And technically, it wasn't presented to Jesus in the form of a question, but there's a question implied in it. In Matthew 13th chapter, of course, Matthew 13, he's teaching in parables. And he teaches one after another after another, just a series of parables there in Matthew 13. And he told one of a, a, a man who sowed uh, tares among the wheat. And his disciples came to him in verse 36. It says, Jesus sent the multitude away. And he went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us. The parable of the terrors in the field. Now that's not presented as a question, but certainly there's a question there. Would you explain to us the parable of the terrors in the field? And then he goes right into it. He says, okay, that's what I'll do. And he goes right on in the following verses and he answers the question, you see. And, and so Jesus oftentimes would do that. The Apostle Paul did that as well. If you turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, it seems if we study the Corinthian letter that they... They had written Paul about some things, and they had some questions, uh, particularly in this context about marriage. And you see in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now the phrase I'm looking at is the things you wrote. They wrote a letter to Paul, and they evidently had a lot of questions. They had a lot of questions about morality and sexual immorality. They had questions about marriage and the relationship of husband and wife, and whether or not marriage is permanent, and what about marriages to unbelievers, and what about widows, 
and, and what about virgins? And so all of those things are covered. And, and, he, and he'll, in fact, in the Corinthian letter, he'll say, now concerning this, or now concerning that, or now concerning the other. And he takes those questions one at a time and answers those questions. And I like to do that. So keep those questions coming. I, I appreciate that. It really helps me a lot in keeping things fresh and keeping things relevant to you people and what you're thinking about and what you're concerned about and what you're struggling with. Now, having said that, I will say this, and I'm not talking to anybody here when I say this, so don't think I'm picking on anybody, but there are questions that some people ask that are simply not sincere. Did you know that? There are people who will try to, to trip you up, and they'll ask trick questions. And there's some examples of that in the Scripture as well. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 22. And I'll give you three or four examples of this. In Matthew 22 and verse 15, it says, The Pharisees went out and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. Now look at there. They're not interested in learning the truth. They're not interested in, in expanding their minds or their understanding of the scriptures. We just want to see if we can trip him up. Let's we'll see if we can, if we can make him make a mistake here so we'll have something to accuse him of. So there's not a sincere question in that situation. And in fact, in that chapter, a, a number of groups come at him. And one group comes at him, and then another group comes at him, and then another. And they all got questions, and they're trying to stump the preacher, trying to stump Jesus. And so not all questions that people ask are sincere. Turn over to John chapter 8. Here's another example of people who ask questions that are not sincere. In John 8, we know the story the woman caught in adultery. And that's interesting to me right there, especially in light of the context. In verse 3, it says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and they had set her in the midst. And they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now what's interesting to me is, where's the other guy? They kind of left him out of the picture, didn't they? Where's that man? She caught, they, they caught her in the very act, so she's with somebody, and yet somehow he's not there. And so from the very get-go, they're not sincere in this at all. And he, they say, verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned, but what do you say? And they're trying to put Jesus on the spot, because certainly the law of Moses would command a stoning uh, had she been found guilty and convicted properly by the law. But the Romans at that time wouldn't allow them to put anyone to death, so they're trying to get Jesus in a political fight here. You're going to uphold the law of Moses or are you going to hold, uphold Roman law? Which one, which one, which horn of the dilemma will you take, Jesus? And verse 6 clarifies that for us. This they said, testing him. They could care less about what he really thought. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. A lot of people have speculated about what Jesus wrote on the ground. I've got no idea what he wrote on the ground, but I know what he was doing. He was giving them what we call a royal ignoring. <laughs> he, that's exactly what he's doing. He just, like, I'm not paying a bit of attention to anything you're saying right now. So when they had continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And we know how the story continues to unfold. But those were questions. But in that case, the questions were insincere. And there are times when Jesus wouldn't answer insincere questions. For example, the baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And Jesus said, well, let me ask, let me, or no, they, no, that wasn't the question they asked him. That was the question he asked them. I got ahead of myself. But they asked him a question. He said, well, let me ask you a question about John. Was it from heaven or from men? They said, well, we can't tell. And so Jesus said, well, if you can't tell me, I'm not going to tell you. In other words, I'm not going to answer your question. You don't have to answer every question. I've known of some preachers in my life who were bullies, and they like to write other preachers. What do you believe about this? And what do you believe about that? And you have to answer us because 1 Peter 3.15 says you have to give an answer and that they're just looking for something to fight to pick. I've, I've run across preachers like that in my life. And to me, that question is not worthy of an answer. In, in some, when someone's just trying to catch you, someone's just trying to entangle you in your talk, and someone's really not caring except for to find something on you, then that's not worth answering. Don't waste your time. But there's a lot of questions out there that people have that are sincere. And I welcome those questions. And I appreciate them and I encourage you to keep asking me those questions. And sometimes I forget. That's why sometimes I'll tell you, send me an email and remind me because sometimes I'll forget. When you get four or five verbal questions going out the door, I may not remember all of them. And so if you, if you think of it, send it to me in an email so I'll remember to address it. But here's something else. 
when you talk about where a preacher might get his sermon ideas, observations. You learn to look around and see what's going on in the world. See what's going on in the community. And you can base a sermon on that sometimes. Turn, if you will, to Acts chapter 17. Here's an example of this in the Bible. Acts 17, Paul goes to Athens, Greece. You can go to this city today, and you can go to this very spot on the hill of Ares. I think there might even be a placard there uh, that, that marks this as the spot. The hill of Ares, or Mars Hill, depending on your translation. But at that time, it was a, an entirely different city, and there were things going on there that perhaps aren't going on today. There was a, a city dedicated to the worship of different kinds of idols. And here's Paul coming into the city, and he's got a completely different perspective on this subject. And so we look here in verse 16. It says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, and he's waiting for Silas and Timothy, but while he waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. Catch that. He saw the city was given over. Observation. I'm looking around. I've come into this new community, and I'm looking around, and I see this is a city that's all given over to idols. They're worshiping false gods, and, and I know something that they need to know. I have a gospel message about the true God, and they have no clue about the true God, and so it stirs him up. It motivates him, and, and he gets an idea here for a sermon. And we just read on in verse 17, because his spirit was provoked, in verse 17, therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. In other words, I'm going to find any place I can preach and preach. I'll go into the synagogue because there's a lot of Jews there and they know the scriptures. And I'll go into the marketplace because there's a lot of Gentiles there. And I'll reason with them. And certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and they said, what does this babbler want to say? And others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak, for you're bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and all this time his mind's been stirring. He's been observing what's going on. He's been watching what's going on in the city, and so he gets this opportunity, this ready-made audience, and they're, they're waiting. They want to hear what he's got to say. And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus. He said, Men of Athens, Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Probably a PC culture. Don't want to offend any of those other gods. So in case we missed one, here's it to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. You see how that fit just perfectly? He observed the situation, and when he got the opportunity, he, he leap, leap, leapt on the opportunity. And he said, I will preach about this. This is what you need to hear as I observe your culture, as I observe your city, as I observe your religion. This is the very thing that you need to hear. By the way, good advice for any preacher is what do these people need to hear? What is it that these, not, not people across the country, but these people right here where I'm at right now, what do they need to hear? And so an observation. Now, think about the application of that. Uh, we see, well, I saw the example in Acts 17, but think about the application of that. You look around the room and you, and you visit and you greet your brethren and you might pick up on the fact that somebody's really grief-stricken right now. They're sad. Something sad has happened to them in their family or to them in their own personal lives. And you know, that person could use a word of encouragement. And so there's a sermon idea. How about a word of encouragement for Brother So-and-So? You don't even have to mention the person's name at all. But how about a word of encouragement for Brother So-and-So? You, you observe brethren who weaken. In fact, a few weeks back we had a sermon like that. I observed that some of the attendants had been falling for a while. And I said, it's time to revisit that subject again. And so I preached that sermon. And I noticed that some, some of you have picked up a little bit. Uh, we could still do better, but some of you have picked up a little bit on that. But you see things going on. You see saints getting weak in their faith, and there's something you can address. Somebody comes and they say, well, I'm having a problem at home with my family. Our kids are doing this and, and we're having to struggle with them. Or my wife says this or my husband says that. And so you can address family issues, not personally, not directly, not by name, 
but in principle, dealing with Bible principles in regard to those things. Now, turn your Bibles, and this is an example of this, 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul had picked up on something in his brethren at Thessalonica, that they had become saddened because some of their brethren, some of their number had passed away. And so he says in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. I see that you're sad. I see that you've lost some brethren. I see that that affects you. But he says, I don't want you to be so sorrowful like people out there in the world who don't have any hope. Remember, those people died without Jesus. And they died and, and went on and they don't have any hope, but that's not so for you. And that's not so for the one you lost, because the one you lost was a Christian too. So he says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now he's not done. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You see what he's done? He's observed his brethren. You've lost people that you love and you're sad and you think they don't have any hope. He says, don't think that way. Jesus is coming back and they're going to be raised. In fact, they're going to get to Jesus before you do. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So he observed that and he gave those words of comfort. And by the way, to this day, how many funerals have you been to and you've heard this text read and alluded to? We still use those words. We still comfort one another with those words. Observation, looking around, seeing what's going on. Another area where you might get sermon ideas is current events things going on around you and around the world, all sorts of things. Jesus did this in His day. Turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 13. Jesus alluded to two relatively current events, relatively recent events in, in His lifetime. In verse 1 of Luke 13, it says, There were present at that time some who told Him about the Galileans, whose blood... Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, we don't know the details here. We just know what's told here. But apparently, there was some kind of a massacre that took place. Pilate being in charge of this. And he killed some people and mingled their blood, the blood of those people, with the sacrifices they were trying to offer to their gods. And they told Jesus about this. This was a tragedy. There was, there was a lot of death that took place. It was a seemingly a needless tragedy. People had been massacred and killed. And Jesus uses that as a, as, a, as a jumping off point for a lesson here on repentance. He said, do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered these things? Yeah, that was a terrible tragedy, wasn't it? They suffered these things and they died and they lost their lives. But don't think like a lot of people do that just because they suffered that they must be bad people. You know, that's, been, that's an old thing that's been around even since the days of Job and perhaps before, that only bad people suffer. And that's simply not true. And Jesus is driving at that. Do you think they were worse sinners because they had this terrible tragedy happen to them? I tell you, no, verse 3. But unless you repent, you will likewise perish. You see, a doom is coming to all sinners, not just those Galileans, but a doom is coming to all sinners unless they repent. Verse 4, he talks about another tragedy. Those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think they were worse sinners than all the others who dwelled in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Another current event. Apparently, the Tower of Siloam fell, and, and, and it, in the falling of that tower, 18 people died. It would make headlines. If they had newspapers back then, that would have been on the headlines. If there were television back then, it would have been, it would have been like the opening story of the news show. And Jesus is alluding to those current events, you see. And we can do that today. There are all sorts of things that happen in society that can give us ideas and springboards for sermons. There are fires that take place. And what can we learn from that? And people losing their homes. We saw that out west just not long ago where people had to move out of their homes. Their homes were burned up. The fires were just covering uh, acres and acres and acres of ground out west. And people lost their homes. Usually 
in the fall of the year, a lot of hurricanes. You'll, you'll see two, three, four hurricanes will hit the, the mainland of the United States and a lot of people will perish and a lot of damage is done. Most people uh, are smart enough to get out. Some people try to ride it out. And, and so, so they end up losing their lives sometimes. But damage there. And so you can use those tragedies to talk about important things, to make people think about their soul, make people think about the brevity of life, make people think about the importance of repentance. That's what Jesus did with it. You should repent because something might befall you and you won't be ready, you see. So you can turn these things into lessons, school shootings uh, that happen. Isn't it sad? I remember when I was a boy, I went to Stony Creek Elementary. That's where these kids go. And... When I was a kid, they left the school open. You could go over there in the summertime. You could play basketball on the basketball courts. You could even go into the school and play basketball inside. Nobody around, not a soul around. Building was open. You could go in. You could play because nobody bothered anything. It was wide open. You could go in there. You could play basketball. You could play on the playground. Nowadays, uh-uh. No, nope, can't do that now because you never know what crazy is going to come up with a gun and try to shoot kids. And try to hurt kids. Sometimes they'll do it right in the middle of the school day when everybody's there, you see. So it's just not safe anymore. It's just sad that we can't even send our kids to school without them having to walk through a, 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 a metal detector. Or, 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 and, and you have to have all these rules and regulations and all these security things. We have security here now. And it's just the world we live in. It's the world we live in. And it's sad. But that's the reality of our world. But you can take those things and you can, you can get lessons out of them. Lessons about repentance. Lessons about being prepared. Lessons about ready, readiness for the Lord. And then you've heard me mention many times 9-11. Some of you now are, are young enough that you don't even know about 9-11 except for what you've been told by your parents. That was some almost 20 years ago. 9-11-2001 I think was the year. And the Twin Towers were knocked down by some terrorists and the Capitol building was, uh, was intended to be attacked and the Pentagon was attacked. And so th that was a great tragedy. 3,000 Americans lost their lives to some radical Muslim terrorists. And you can get lessons from that and you can teach about that. Pearl Harbor, sometimes people will refer to that. It was, it was a tragedy, a disaster that happened. But people can, can look to that and get lessons and get ideas for sermons out of things like that. So look around. By the way, I've got some meetings this year, and some of you are probably going to be standing here in my place while I'm gone. Here's some ideas for you. Here's some places where you can get sermon ideas. That's, that's one of the reasons that I did this sermon. You can, you can understand where to get ideas for lessons. Some sermons are just reminders, just friendly little reminders. We forget. I think that's one of the reasons why God had so many memorials in His Word. Take 12 stones out of the Jordan River and set them up over here as a memorial. Take this bread, drink this cup. And so... In the scripture, many, many memorials are set up because we have a tendency to forget things. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about this, the need to be reminded constantly. That's what I was kind of like what I was saying earlier. I used to think these people don't want to hear another sermon on baptism. But Peter says, think again. Preach that lesson on baptism again. Remind people again. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 12, he says, have I got the right verse here? Yeah. I think it's 2 Peter. That's why my notes said 1 Peter. 2 Peter 1 and verse 12. Peter says, Therefore, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. You already know this stuff. All I'm doing is reminding you. Yes, I think it right as long as I'm in this tent. This tent's his body. As long as I'm alive, in other words. As long as I'm alive, I think it's right to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. I'm going to die pretty soon. Moreover, verse 15, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Now, how was Peter going to do that? By writing it down. We're still reading it today. 2,000 years later, we're still reading about Peter's reminders to those brethren, to remind them about the faith. But notice about three times in those three verses, three or four verses, he says, to remind you. I want to remind you. I want to remind you. So some sermons are just reminders. We need them every once in a while. 
we need to be reminded about the importance of sound doctrine, to make sure that what is taught is true to the book, and to make sure that false doctrine doesn't make inroads in a congregation. One of the things that comes up many times when false doctrine rears its ugly head, you'll have a certain number of people who will say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Just let it go. Well, you can't let it go. If it's false doctrine, if it's patently false, you can't let it go. You have to address it because, as the Bible says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And you let one thing come in, and the next generation is going to bring something else in, and the next generation is going to bring something else in, and before you know it, the church is gone. They're no longer a church of Christ. They've departed from the faith. And so the reminders about sound doctrine, the reminders about attendance, the reminders about morality, our culture is awash in immorality. And so preachers need to be reminding people about proper morals. Christians don't smoke, and Christians don't drink, and Christians don't cuss, and Christians don't commit fornication, and Christians don't run around on their spouses. Those kinds of things. Reminders. And even though we know these things, we need to have it brought before our minds again and again and again. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul had warned about a departure that was coming. In fact, in verse 1, 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. There's going to be a people who leave the gospel, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from food which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And then in verse 6 he says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, in other words, remind them. Remind them that this is coming. Remind them that it comes to every church. Remind them of these things, these dangers, these false doctrines that arise, and let them know what the truth is. Not because they don't know it, but because they do. And they just need that friendly reminder. Lastly, Sometimes we just like to preach about our personal interests. There are topics that fascinate me that may not fascinate you, and I'm sure the reverse is true. There are topics in the Bible that fascinate you uh, that don't interest me in the least. But we all have things that we like to talk about. And, and to illustrate this, I'll just talk about the Apostle John. I won't cite all these passages because you'll know when I say it what I'm talking about here. But John, he's, he's referred to as the Apostle of Love. And you know why he is, don't you? When you read through 1 John, he's always saying, Things like, this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. If a man says, I love God, but he hates his brother, he's a liar. Because if he, how can he love the thing made in the image of God if he doesn't love God Himself, you see? So he talks about love. He's the apostle of love. That's, that seems to be one interest that he had. He talks about love so much in his preaching. And some of my interests over the years have been different. They've changed over the years. But one of the interests I've always, I used to have, and not as much now as I used to, but it was the church. I like to study about the church. I like to study about the work of the church, the organization of the church, the worship of the church. And I also like to expand that out a little bit. I will talk about the church versus the kingdom. Because years ago, brethren had it drilled into their heads that the church and the kingdom are always the same thing. And the truth of the matter is they're not always the same thing. Uh, it's just not true. And you've heard me over the years bring that out and develop that theme. But the church and the kingdom are not always the same thing. Sometimes they are, but not always because the kingdom goes beyond the church. God rules over everything and God rules over everyone. And so the kingdom is actually beyond or larger than the church. That fascinates me. And it also helps me and gives me an opportunity to kind of help people mature a little bit and grow a little bit and see beyond what they've always been taught and what they've always had hammered into their heads. I used to like, and I am not nearly as interested in it anymore as I used to, or now as I used to be, but the women's role in the church, that fascinated me. Years ago, I used to go to Stylesville, and that's where I cut my teeth preaching. Those poor brethren had to put up with a lot of lame sermons back then. But I was learning, and they were content to let me come down there and keep learning. But I noticed down there that they didn't divide up into classes. And, they, and I had some conversations with some of the folks. And, and, and some of them had very, very strong views about women speaking or women asking questions. So that began to really be an interest to me. So I did a lot, a lot, a lot of study on that. Not nearly as interested in that as I used to be. 
But there are things you get interested in, is what I'm driving at. And so you like to talk about that. Another thing I like to talk about still is traditions and being able to distinguish between divine traditions and human traditions. And sometimes we have a hard time distinguishing those things and we, we tend to think our preference or the way we've always done it must be the way it has to be. It can't be any different. And we need to learn to open our eyes and see, is this really God's way or is there another way that we can do it and still be pleasing to God? So traditions is another thing I like to talk about. Not too long ago, we had a study on the atonement. That fascinated me. I'd been studying that actually off and on for many, 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 many years because I always wanted to understand that. And I'm not sure that we'll ever fully understand it. There's a lot involved in that. But those are things that interest me. And so sometimes that's what preachers, where they're coming from, just something that they like to talk about, something they like to dig into. It reminds me, though, of a story old preacher years ago, they said somehow or another, every sermon was about baptism. And it was getting old. They weren't learning anything. They weren't, learning, they weren't getting beyond that. They weren't leaving the elementary principles. Every sermon was about baptism. So somebody suggested, said, hey preacher, said, why don't you preach from Genesis? Genesis 1. And he said, okay, I will. And he said, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. And the Spirit of God was moving on the face of the waters. And speaking of water, <laughs> and so he launched into his sermon on baptism. But you can't, you can't be like that. You know, that becomes like a hobby horse where you're just the same old, same old, same old topic every single time. You've got to kind of move on and talk about other things. So bottom line here, when you look at all of this, and I suppose we could add things to the list, but the bottom line is what we saw at the very beginning in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. Preach the word. That's the bottom line, isn't it? Preach the word. And he told Timothy in another place, in, Second Tim, in fact, two chapters earlier, he said, the things you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Say what God said about it and say no more. But here's the most important thing, and I don't get that much here, what I'm about to say. I don't get it much here, but I used to get it a lot in Kentucky, I'd preach a sermon, and some brother would come up and say, who were you preaching that at? <laughs> who were you preaching that at? Most of the time, I'm not preaching at somebody. I'm not going to say that never happens. But most of the time, I'm not preaching at somebody. Most of the time, I'm aiming at everybody, and I'm trying to convert the lost, and I'm trying to edify the saints. But there are people that get fascinated with that. Who was he talking about today? And so I'd like to say to you this, instead of looking at preaching like that, who's he talking about today, why don't you look at it like this, how can I apply that lesson to me? That's the way we should look at every lesson, not who was he talking about, who was he getting on, whose toes was he stepping on, but how can I apply that lesson to me? How will that help me? How will that improve me in my life? That's the right way to look at every sermon that you hear preached from the pulpit. Take out your songbooks if you're using them and turn to the song of invitation. See, I told you I wasn't going to keep you that long. If you're here tonight and are not a Christian, we would like to encourage you to rethink that proposition and change your mind and become a Christian. And the beautiful thing about God's plan, His plan is so simple. You can take that gospel message anywhere in the world and save souls with it. It, it, doesn't, take, uh, it doesn't take a lot of ritual. It doesn't take a lot of of, of uh, trimmings and claptrap, it's a very simple thing. And if you believe that Jesus died for your sins and you believe He's the King and you're willing to submit to Him, you can become a Christian in the next 15 minutes, just that quick. Because we're going to sing a song to encourage you to make the decision. And then if you make the decision, you come forward, I'll take your confession that you believe in the deity of Christ, that He's the Son of God. And we'll take you right here in this tank of water behind me, and in a matter of moments, you'll be a Christian. And your sins will be forgiven. See, that's how simple God's plan is, and it applies to everybody. It's the same plan for me and for you and for all the world. And if you're willing to come to Christ, please do it right now while we stand and while we sing.